In autobiography of a yogi, we have the story of Master having come to America in 1920, <clears throat> and we have the whole uh, saga of his search for a guru, his finding of Sri Yukteswar, his years in his master's hermitage, 10 years of very strict training under a very demanding um, avatar, and master describing all the different ways in which his, um, his limitations were hammered out by Sri Yukteswar. The story that master writes in Autobiography of a Yogi is a bit uh, embellished um, to make it seem more like Master was just any seeker who happened to have the very good karma to have these experiences. A lot of that, Swamiji explains, was that Master wrote that book in America. It was published in 1946. And here Yogananda was the first great emissary um, to make his life and mission in the West and he was in, in this completely foreign culture. I mean, of course, human beings are the same all over the world, but the orientation of the American culture is very, very different than the orientation of the Indian culture. The Indian culture is focused on the internal spiritual realities as being primary. The American culture especially is focused on the material world being the primary world. And it's a very different, um, completely different way of thinking about things. So if Yogananda was going to get the attention of the Westerners that he'd come to serve, it, it wouldn't have served him to present himself at that time as this um, great person who spoke only in a big bass voice and marched down the street like this making pronouncements. He had to come in to our energy, and our energy is uh, in interested and determined and practical and egalitarian in its approach, and that's how Master presented himself. He was a young man also, but his whole autobiography is the search, really. When uh, people wanted to make a movie, when Swami Kriyananda wanted to make a movie about Yogananda's life, um, the movie Awake has come out. It's a, more of a documentary. Swamiji wanted to do more of a dramatization of his life. And God willing, it will eventually be done. Everybody kept wanting to make a movie out of Autobiography of a Yogi. And Swami Kriyananda's answer was, but that's not really the story of Yogananda. Yogananda's life was when he got to America and who he really was in terms of, of how he could transform people's consciousness Autobiography of a Yogi is a story of a young man's search. Well, having said all of this, here's the point. In Autobiography of a Yogi in 1935 and 36, Yogananda goes back to India. And he takes with him, among others, Richard Wright, who was the brother of, of the woman Diamata, who became president of SRF. Yogananda had intended for Richard Wright to be president, but in fact, to be his successor, but in fact, Richard took another direction in his life. So he traveled with Yogananda, and he observed and he wrote a diary. So there comes the point where, after 15 years, Yogananda is going to go back and see his guru, Sri Yukteswar. And he's, he's been the disciple of this great master. And now Yogananda has gone off on his own and become um, the guru of his own uh, work and all of the people in America who who come to know Yogananda well, including Richard, you know, hold him in absolute esteem, and a master is without peer. There's no one in, in the atmosphere around him who stands with him. Everyone stands touching his feet beneath him. But now the disciple goes, master becomes not the guru, but the disciple. <clears throat> and interestingly, master in his autobiography says, I'll quote from Richard's diary, because I think Master himself had no way to say it. And of course, you can imagine how interested Richard was in seeing it all. And he just describes how astonishing it was to see his own great master become the little chela again, become the little boy, touch the feet of his master, and even be reprimanded by Sri Yukteswar. No one in the world that Richard lived in with Yogananda would ever have reprimanded Yogananda, but all of a sudden he goes into this inner relationship. And the relationship is guru-disciple. 
And in our reading today, we have the story of Jesus and John the Baptist, which is a very confusing story because the way it is described, and Yogananda explains this in his commentary on the Bible, and it's just a confusing element in spiritual life because spiritual life is not tidy. We want it to all fit into these neat little mental concepts that we build up. But the soul that is John the Baptist has been the guru of Jesus. But the way the story is told, John gave much of his spiritual power away to Jesus. And in this particular life, Jesus is, has a, a more elevated consciousness than John. I don't understand it. I asked Swami, why in the story that's so confusing anyway did we have this thrown in? Swami just shrugged his shoulders. He had absolutely no answer for me. It's just confusing. But nonetheless, when John the Baptist appears on the scene, Jesus recognizes him as his own guru. And John says, and truthfully, you know, there's one coming whose, whose shoelace I am not worthy to untie. This is how John describes Jesus, because John was the precursor. He announced the Messiah is coming. I am not the Messiah, but the Messiah is coming. And when Jesus is there, John declares him. When Jesus goes to John and asks to be baptized by him, and John says, how can I baptize you? Baptize means what can I give you? To baptize someone is to give them of the Spirit. It's not about dunking you in the water and it doesn't really matter whether you're fully immersed or just partly immersed and all of these theological things that happen, these arguments that happen, none of that is what counts. What it is, is that the Holy Spirit is given to you and you are baptized in that Spirit. That's what changes you. If you just get in water, you get out and you're dry and you're just the same. Nothing happens what you have to be baptized in is the Spirit. And Jesus asked John to baptize him. John says, how can I baptize you? You are the Holy Spirit. What can I give you? But Jesus says, but it's in the fitness of things that you should baptize me. Because what Jesus is saying, everything I have become is because of you. And therefore, once again, I touch your feet and you... Immerse me in the water and baptize me. It's in the fitness of things that this should be done. We never forget. Even if, as, as often happens or should happen, sometimes the guru, the disciple surpasses the guru. The guru, even though he has a great state of realization sufficient to, uh, to baptize the disciple, there may still be some lingering karma in that guru and the disciple may become completely free. Swami tells the story of a disciple of Ramana Maharshi that was like that. But the relationship is always there. Now, the point that I'm wanting to come to here is to talk about what the power of that relationship must be. That even a soul, having achieved the, the apex of God-realization, still defers and doesn't defer just out of, well, this is the form, this is what I'm supposed to do, out of the complete fullness of their heart, they defer. Because they understand that everything that I am, nothing that has come to me would ever have come to me without the intercession of this master. And how does that intercession take place? This is, the, this is so important for those of us who are resistant to the idea of discipleship and for those of us who have embraced it. I was reading something recently and a, a person remarked and very truly they said my whole personality has been a reaction to sub, a reaction to subconscious influences that I didn't even know were there. Now think about the way we are in life. Somebody speaks to us in a certain way and we react. Somebody wants something of it of us and we're very eager to have that position or we're very afraid to have that position. We, certain aspects of our life make us lie awake at night with anxiety. Certain imaginary ideas are so filled with fear. We're insecure about not being recognized, not being loved, being made lonely, whatever it might be. We have all these different forces that are pushing on us and we, we barely can remember what happened to us in this incarnation 
Think of the many, 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 many things that happen to us in other incarnations. This is a, a story about that was uh, attached to me, and I don't even know if it was true or not, but it was interesting when it happened. I was talking once about a, a period of time I went through where I used to become slightly anxious when I was uh, traveling. And I wasn't anxious about being on a plane. I was anxious about being in the airport and just afraid if people, if I was alone or if people weren't with me and where is everyone. And it wasn't a joke. It was absurd, but it wasn't a joke. It just was a very real feeling until I finally uh, reasoned and talked my way out of it and it passed. Well, I was sharing this story with a group of people and a, a woman came up to me who has a, a kind of psychic ability and she told me this picture that she saw of a small child whose mother had died and whose father couldn't take care of her and took the child on a train some distance from where the family lived and then abandoned the child on the train platform. Yeah, pretty scary story. When she told me that story, because she thought it was me, she was explaining why I was anxious in the airport, I have to say a kind of shudder went through me. You know, you can imagine it, these things happen. These things happen because we need them to happen. And I had this sudden, just sort of feeling um, of recognition, which I can't really assert is true or not, but it was apocryphal if not actual. Because I had this sudden recognition of how much strength had come to me from that lifetime and how many faults simultaneously. Imagine a small child, let's just play this out, a small child having to make, make its way on its own, you know, and developing a certain kind of willpower that would not be deterred. And you can also imagine there wouldn't be a lot of space in that lifetime to be really sensitive to other people's realities. Too much is at stake. I mean, it's a random example. Make up your own. And then ever thereafter, there is this deeply rooted, vritti, way down in your spine. You don't remember anymore being abandoned on a railroad platform. Fortunately, when we die, the specifics of each incarnation go away. But that idea, my survival depends on me, and, you know, I, I can't think about other people's needs. I can only think about my own. Our whole personality gets formed in reaction to subconscious experiences that we don't even know are there. Now, how do we begin to figure out what's true and what isn't true? Maybe we've been a disciple of someone in the past who turned out to be a scoundrel. And they took advantage of us and we ended up someplace we didn't really want to be. Maybe that, that person took all my money. Maybe that person took advantage of me in some way. And then later on, we start hearing about, in other incarnations, we st start hearing about teachers. We hear about true masters. And what is our response? Reaction to subconscious impulses we don't even know are there. How are we going to sort this out? And reason always follows feeling. Whenever we have a prejudice towards something or against it. We think about all the reasons in the world why it's true. Sri Yukteswar in autobiography gives us one of those examples. As a young child, he said, I developed an attachment for an ugly dog. And no offer of any more attractive pets could dissuade me. And then he says the moral of the story. This is when Yogananda asked him to tell, tell me some stories from your childhood. He said, uh, attachment and desire lends an imaginary air of attractiveness to the object of one's desire. Isn't that so? We become attached to something, we become infatuated, and it just looks so good to us. We're always in reaction to subconscious impulses we don't even know. And the, the quest for a teacher is not necessarily per se, the quest for a teacher. It may just be the quest for happiness, for freedom, for truth. The first sentence of Autobiography of a Yogi is extremely interesting. It says, in almost these words, the characteristic feature of Indian culture has always been the search for eternal verities. 
Now that itself is just a beautiful phrase. The, the culture of India, the country of India, as Master put it, has always been the guru of the planet. It's the only continuous civilization on, on, on earth today in which the values and the organization of that society have always been the same. And the characteristic feature is the, the search for the, the eternal internal truth. I mean, our search in America has always been how to make it bigger and better. Isn't that right? Bigger and better and more efficient. Traveling in India with friends uh, on some of the pilgrimage trips we used to take years ago, we were somewhere on some road site, and women uh, were from from down this steep hill were carrying rocks on their heads up the hill and then dumping them and then walking back down the hill. and And one of the men who worked in the tech industry here, he said, "I'm just too American." He said, "I would build a machine." <laughs> just like that. And that's exactly right. I would build a machine. That's just what we do. Physical efficiency, that's just the way it is. You know, in India where there's such overpopulation and underemployment, especially 30 years ago before globalization really took hold, with the first hotel we went to, there was a man who sat. There was one man on each floor. And he would sit there all day, and then when you would come, he would spring up, and he would take your key from you, and you would open your door. <laughs> and then he would go back. <laughs> but, you know, he had a job. I mean, that was part of it. He had a job. It was just the way, the way things, completely different um, sets of values. But what Master said is the search for eternal verities, for the internal reality. The rest of the sentence, it's not even a different sentence, which leads to the disciple-guru relationship. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole story is right there. If we're trying to find out what is lastingly true, sooner or later, and if it doesn't happen for you sooner, it'll happen for you later. Everybody has to do this in their own way that sooner or later we will recognize the limits of our own capacity to change ourselves. You know, I, I never was thinking per se that I needed a teacher or a guru or anything like that when I was younger. I just knew that I didn't know. That's all. I just didn't know. And I really wanted to know. And what I wanted to know was, well, I was searching for eternal verities I mean, none of those words were in my mind. What was in my mind was, well, I, I, again, I was always subconsciously, I was always reacting to subconscious influences, and I didn't even know what they were. I didn't even know they were affecting me. There was just this overwhelming sense of what is going on here, and how am I going to cope with this? I'm just a child now, but what will happen? And it was, it was just this almost uh, a paralyzing lack of understanding. And nobody looking at me would have seen it. I just went through the world seemingly like a perfectly well-adjusted person and in a nice family, and everything was right there. But internally there was this, I can only use the word quaking, this quaking. And I, I, I moved step by step as I was supposed to move, but always quaking. Well, you know, where, is the, where are the answers? And the, the instant somebody gave me something that had that vibration of truth, which was first a book, just handed me a book by Vivekananda. I opened it up and it vibrated with knowledge. This is good karma. And this is also in Autobiography of a Yogi, that first sentence does not say guru, disciple relationship. It says disciple, guru relationship. Because what we need in order to advance in this mystery of life is the humility to learn. And it's a very strange balance because you have to have an enormous amount of personal commitment to your own experience and your own quest. 
Because everybody's going to try to turn you away from it. Everybody. It's just a test on the spiritual path. And after you find a path, people will come to you and tell you that, of course, you know, what you're involved in now is really not what it seems. And when it comes to you, just face it courageously. But also recognize it happens to everyone. It's a good sign. Apparently, God thinks you're worth testing. You know, you wouldn't even be sitting in the room where the test is happening if somebody didn't think you could face it and pass it at this point. Or Satan thinks that you're too good a prospect for the light and he's going to try to take you down at this point. Because you have to also develop this tremendous power of trusting your own experience. Because to go on the spiritual path is to, is to follow an inner star that is your own unique melody. But that doesn't mean you do it alone. You have to have that humility to recognize the limits of your own capacity and then have the intuition to, to recognize truth when it's offered to you. And then that amazing balance is to understand then how to navigate this. And, you know, every step of the path is complicated. And what we're building um, is really no external relationship. We, we imagine that if we, if we could only be in the company of and then we make a list. I need a, I need a living master. I need someone to tell me exactly what to do. No, we need exactly what circumstances have given us. You know, what is the first law of prosperity and abundance? It's gratitude for what you have. If you squander the gifts that are given to you, if somebody's giving you presents and giving you beautiful clothes and they come and they find they're just strewn all over the floor and you're walking on them, or you're, you're wearing your beautiful new dress out to milk the cows and getting it completely covered with dirt, or you're, somebody gives you a beautiful pearl necklace and you whine that I never liked pearls, I only like rubies. You know, how inspiring is that to the one who's giving you gifts? How likely is it that more will be given to you? You think, this is, these are just the obvious laws of prosperity and abundance in this world. Whatever we have, we must use to its fullest capacity. And then more will be given to us. And so if we say, I'm not going to really listen until, well, then God says, great, enjoy your incarnations. You know, if you fight for your delusions, as some popular writer said, the reward is you get to keep them. You know, so if you argue for your point of view, then you get to have it. And how's that working for you? That's just the question. How is this working for me? So whatever opportunities are given to us, whatever teachings, whatever relationship with the Master, whatever opportunity to be a disciple, drink it in. Drink it in. Fill your glass over and over and take complete advantage of it. Because when you're using, when you're opening the channel, when you have become a disciple, Sister Gyanamata said, from my study of Indian wisdom, Sister Gyanamata was Master's most advanced disciple. And she was in her 50s up before she met Master. From my study of Indian wisdom, she said, I knew I needed a guru, but uh, there was no guru for me to follow for decades of her life. So I decided to make life itself my guru, she said to receive every experience with the attitude of a disciple, to see every circumstance as if it were a lesson coming directly from my guru. Now, implied in that is this receptivity to learn, isn't it? This, this is what I think is true so far, but what do you think? And the master is always there, just waiting to be asked. Just waiting to be asked. What do you think? You know, this... This is my idea about it. What do you think? Guide me. Guide me through my own inner voice. Guide me through the voice of others. Guide me through the circumstances of my life. And this is not surrendering ourselves in the sense of passivity. Passivity does not work on the path of self-realization. Dynamic humility. Where we are absolutely working with everything that we have but at the edge of that, we say, and then, 
It's ama- these, the masters are as alive within us, more alive within us than the people who are around us. Because the people who are around us don't know us. They may love us. They may respect us. They may help us. They may do so much for us. But they don't know us like the masters know us. And they can't be with us in that inmost part. They can't go beneath that constant reaction to subconscious realities we don't even remember. But the Master lives in all of it. And when we want to know, they will tell us. And so what we must cultivate above all, quite simply, is the desire to know, the courage to know, the willingness and the devotion to know. God bless you.